Everybody celebrate that name that is above all names. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Do you know him? Do you know who I'm talking about today? His name is Jesus. We've come here to encounter one person. One person. Man, it's not the preacher, thank God. It's not the band. It, honestly, it's not even the person next to you. It's the person of Jesus Christ. Because I know that when we have a fresh encounter with Jesus, it changes everything, man. It changes my heart. It changes my attitude. It changes my perspective. Everything changes when I encounter Jesus. And so that's who we've come to, to honor today, to celebrate, to lift up high. And check it out. I don't know about your week. I didn't have a voice till Thursday. But I was like, man, this, this is my jam. I'm celebrating the name of Jesus with this team up here. I can't help but sing because I know how good he, he is. Scripture tells us that he's the same today as he was yesterday as he's going to be tomorrow. He's the only one that you can count on. Man, check it out. I don't know who you've been relying on lately. But can I just press in? I, I'm not even bringing the word today, but sorry, Chantha, but, 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 but can I just encourage you? Can I just encourage you? Right where you're at. Right where you're at. W would you just have this, this heart posture? Lord Jesus, I want to counter you afresh and anew. Lord, I don't want to go through the motions of another Sunday. Just check it off my list. I've... I've gone to church. Lord, help me to realize today that because of the resurrected Savior who is Jesus, I am the church. So, Lord, I pray that you would teach us. You would reveal yourself to us afresh and anew today, God. Lord, that we would leave this place changed because of you. We agree together that there's power in your word. And Lord, all of us need a fresh word from you today. So open wide our hearts and communicate clearly the truth of your word. It's in the one and only name of Jesus we, we celebrate, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, take your seats. Welcome home. Welcome to Discovery Church. I want to welcome those that are joining us live and online and those that are joining us in our coffee venue. I'm so thankful you would step out and brave the snow, the winter Florida snow. You know what I'm talking about, that, that little mist that, that comes down. I'm so glad you would brave that to, to come on and to, to worship King Jesus today. I want to invite you to this time to take out that Connect card. If you're a first-time guest with us, take out that Connect card. Or maybe you've never filled out that, that guest, uh, that, that Connect card, your second time, third time, or you've been here for a year, I don't know. But would you just take out that card, and uh, on the back side, you can actually scan it with your, with your phone, and it will take you to wearediscovery.co. And uh, the front side, you can just uh, fill in the blanks right there. And uh, at the end of the worship experience, the offering plates are going to come by. And you can just place that card in those plates as, as they come by. And, uh, and, so, and so that's the, that's the Connect card. H have I told you that? I I'm glad you're here today. Have I told you that? Cool. You, you got that? Cool. And, and so here's what I love. Man, 10 years ago when we, when we gathered, uh, just eight of us in a home, and we said the Lord was leading us to start a work called Discovery Church. And I cast vision, man, in those early days that we were going to be a church that planted churches. Man, we were going we to be about the kingdom of God, not, not the, the kingdom of us. How many of you know there's lots of different local expressions of the church? And we need all those expressions to reach all of these people for Jesus Christ. And so today I've invited my friend, Chantha Chim. He's going to be launching a work in God's timing, he's going to be launching a work in, in Vero, not just him, but his bride, Susan, uh, Caleb, Corbin, and Carter. Did I get them? Did I get all three? Okay. Caleb, Corbin, and Carter. And then, hey, can we just show some love for, for some of the core team that have come today from Vero, Vero Beach, some of the core team? And can I just say this to you? Can I just say this to you? Sorry, bro. Shave one minute off your message. No, I'm just kidding. Take us in. Here's the deal. You don't want to run ahead of God. It's easy to do that, man. It's easy to get fired up and get excited. Man, we're going to, man, we're marching in hell, right? You've heard it with water pistols. I don't know where that came from, but, but a lot of times that's how we feel. It's easy to, man, we want to run ahead of God. But it's also easy to get comfortable and just kind of get behind God. Can I just encourage you, core team? Listen, can I just encourage you today? 
man, we're on with God. Allow him to lead. Don't try to plan this whole thing out. Allow God to lead you. Allow God to provide in ways that you would have never imagined. Allow God to use you for his glory, for his name's sake. It's all about Jesus. I hope you hear that today. Man, it's not about you. Sorry, to, sorry, man. If it, sorry if that, that hurts a little bit. But I just want you to know right out the gate, man, it's not about you. It wasn't about the eight people sitting in the living room 10 years ago. Nah, that's about the name of Jesus. It's for his name's sake that we move forward and advance the kingdom of God. So once again, would you pray, uh, pray with me? Lord Jesus, speak. Speak today. We need to hear from you. We love you. We thank you. We celebrate you. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. They draw your attention to the screens. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, a neighborly day for a beauty. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? I've always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you. So let's make the most of this beautiful day. Since we're together, we might as well say, would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you please? Won't you please? Please won't you be my neighbor? Well, praise God. Good morning, church family. Look at your neighbor and say, hey, neighbor, I'm glad I don't look like you. I'm just kidding. Well, welcome to Discovery Church. My name is Chantha Chim. Try to remember that, would you? I've heard it twisted in many different ways. The recent one, this was just about a week and a half ago. Someone called me on the phone and said, hello, may I speak to Java Chim, please? And listen, I love, ch I love coffee, so I was okay and acceptable with that name. I've been down in the south in North Carolina, and a little girl asked me one time, Hello, sir, nice meeting you. Why is your name Chocolate Chip? <laughs> it's different expressions, but um, I'm glad for my name. I didn't pick out my name. How many of you picked out your name when you were born? It didn't work out like that, did it? But I'm glad to have our friends from Vero that are joining you. It's a full house today. And I'm glad that you're here, ready to worship God. The worship was on fire today. My goodness, worship team, way to go. Thank you for bringing uh, just the spirit of worship. And I'm glad, I'm always glad when I get to see a church family worship with the worship team. You know what I'm talking about? Because it's different when you're watching a people just worship and say, man, I'm glad they're worshiping Jesus, but you're over here just like, you know, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. But I, I was standing over the corner, I was standing in the back, and I was just watching a church family engage in the spirit of worship. So I want to say thank you, Discovery Worship Team, for doing an amazing job. And you know that the power and the presence of God is in the room where you just sense it and you know it. And you know that that's not a work that you can just make up, but that's the spirit of the living God. And that's in the name of Jesus that we come today, the resurrected king. He's doing a new thing. He is doing a new work. Whatever dead bones that have been in there, man, he is ready to speak life and truth. And the power of God is ready to resurrect whatever dead it is that you're feeling in there right now. So I'm praying in the name of Jesus and the spirit of Christ that it would just hover in this room. And whatever you need to come alive in you this week, it would just come alive. Because God is not the God of dead. God is the God of alive. 
You see, humans try to make him dead. And they try to put him in that tomb. But you can't keep him dead. He's resurrecting. He's working. He keeps his promises. What he says, he will fulfill. And what he says for Discovery Church 10 years ago, in the heart of a man, I am planting a new work. And it is coming to fruition. God's doing something here. He's going to turn this city upside down for Jesus Christ through Discovery Church. He's going to turn Port St. Lucie. He's going to turn uh, all this community, Fort Pierce, upside down because the people are willing to get on fire with Jesus and say, let's go, let's roll. And then we're asking in this series, sermon series, won't you be my neighbor? Won't you come along with me for the ride of what God is doing at our church and in this community? Would you get on board with what God is doing and won't you be my neighbor? I love, there's nobody, like I was looking for a red sweater. Because how many of you know we just need Asian Mr. Rogers? I mean... I tried, but it didn't work out, so I got out my gray sweater. I feel great. Um, Pastor Tim, he planted some Asians in the church to make me feel more comfortable. <laughs> I'm good with that. You guys from Burma, man, you tore it up. What's up, y'all? Asian invasion. Let's roll. <laughs> but I love the series, and I've been praying for you all, and I've been praying about what God would have in this series of messages and why God allowed me to come and join you all in this particular message. And Pastor Tim, thank you for the invitation. Serve like Jesus. Love like Jesus. No greater example within Scripture. No greater example within humanity. No greater example in this world has ever seen than the Lord Jesus Christ. He epitomizes and he exemplifies what it means to love your neighbor, serve your neighbor as you would yourself. Throughout scripture, he gives us these indications. And as we look into the book of Mark, chapter number 10, today, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels. Today we'll be in the Gospel of Mark, looking at chapter number 10 to understand what it means to serve like Jesus. Has anyone ever asked you something that they have no idea what they're asking for? There was an occasion where a couple of disciples came to Jesus and said, Master, when you're in heaven one day, would you give us the privilege of being at your right hand? I mean... They had no idea what they were encountering and what they were asking. Has anyone ever asked you something that they have no idea what they're really asking for? That's a boatload of questions that you don't even realize how and what it takes to get to where I am today. I love the psalm. In Psalm 23, it says, The Lord is whose shepherd? My shepherd. And he leads me, what's the next word? Through the valley of the shadow of death. But you see, when we as believers, we want to get to the other side of wherever it is that we want God to take us to. In that journey of life, in the kingdom of God, in the will of God. Lord, that's the person I want to marry. That's the place I want to live at. That's the, uh, that's the job I want. We want to be on the other side. But God says, I will lead you, say the word, through the shadow of the valley of death. I will fear no evil, but we have the concept in our Christianity a little bit skewed. We just want to be on the other side without walking through it. So here's some of the disciples, James and John, the beloved, says to the Lord Jesus, Lord, I want to have greatness in your kingdom. So therefore, I want to be on the other side. And as a matter of fact, on that other side, I want to sit at your right hand. So why don't you tell us who's going to do that? Go ahead. Because you know you love me, right? I mean, out of all 12 of us, we're tight. Like, yo, remember, I'm John. I leaned on your chest. 
I mean, do you remember when we were in the living room together? Do you remember when we were uh, hanging out together? That's what he was thinking. No, 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 it's, it's me, John. It's James. You know, I, I'm J-A before J-O, so, you know, alphabetically, I should be the one. And this wasn't working out for them because they're asking a question they didn't realize. And oftentimes we ask questions in our lives that we don't realize what it means to get to where we need to be. I want you to think about that thought because you've probably heard it before if you're ever a Marvel Comics fan, the disciple Spider-Man, otherwise known as Peter Parker, whose uncle said to him, Peter, with great power comes great responsibility. You really want great power, James and John. You really want great privilege. But that comes with a lot of responsibility. You see, we live in a generation today that we want things now. And we want things easy. We want things that everyone else worked for and we're willing to work for it to an extent. But we don't understand what it means to practice true greatness. So in the words of Peter's uncle, with great power comes great responsibility. And are you willing to exercise that responsibility in the kingdom of Christ so that you can receive the greater reward? One day you will enter into heaven's portals and there will be an angel who will say, enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Well done. You good and faithful servant. Not you good and faithful businessman. Not you good and faithful achieved sportsman. Not you great and faithful church member only. Servant. And so how in the world do I get to that point where we say, where, where Christ says, come on, right here, you have been a good and faithful, say it with me, servant, servant. <coughs> Our world and libraries and books are filled and shelves. We want to be a great leader and in charge, but God is calling us to be countercultural. He is calling us not to lead, but he's calling us to serve. Because in Christianity, the greatness of your leadership is the greatness of your serving. So the greatness, then, therefore, of this community is a church that is willing to serve. Therefore, the greatness of this church is going to be marked by those members that will say, Here am I, Lord, let me serve. Not let me lead. Not let me be involved, but let me serve. How do I become the hands and the feet and the mouth of Jesus on a practical level? How do I just be the body of Christ and love my neighbor as I love myself? How do I serve? We've got to answer that question because we can't just say, well, I'm willing to serve, but in what capacity can I serve? What would God want me to do and what are the greatest needs? And we'll explore that together. One of the funnest things I love is just lately, I'm a tense person by nature, especially if you know me. My wife has given me the, yep, that's you. <laughs> Pretty tense. But I love lately where we've been able to just have some meaningful time together in the front of my living room. My wife sits on one side of, the, uh, of it, her, on her side of the chair and me on the other and just enjoying the presence of God and just writing in our journals and, and praying. And one of the things I'm really coming into a better conclusion and reality, I learned this, this is a scientific study, that you release more stress hormones, the happier you are. We all want to be happy, but then the journey that it takes to get there is quite unique, isn't it? Oh, man, we work hard, we toil hard, we labor hard to get to happiness so that we can retire. But what would it take just to be happy in the journey 
so that I don't have to get so stressed out so that I can de-stress. Our brains are actually wired. This is what I found out. Our brains are actually wired to serve others. When we serve others, our brain releases stress hormones which elevate our mood and actually make us happier. That's crazy. Can you think about it in the church when you walked in and when you pulled into the parking lot and there were greeters and there was a guy named John and his front crew with nice boots on and his jeans and he's just ready to rock for Jesus and he's waving people down. What makes him so happy? Is it because he's naturally happy? Maybe. Or could it be that he was just ready to serve? Could it be that the people who are ready to receive people in the name of Jesus, ready to shake hands, ready to set up chairs since Friday, and ready to do all of this stuff, was there a little bit more expectation in them? Why? Because they were ready to make others happy in the name of Jesus. Where can you serve in the kingdom of Christ at Discovery Church that you can begin releasing your stress hormones and begin discovering that a lot earlier than later? I love what someone said about Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A doesn't just serve sandwiches. Chick-fil-A, though I will say that that is God's chicken. I believe their french fries are amazing and otherwise known as, you know, those crisp cut fries. But here's what I found out about Chick-fil-A, and you'll all agree with me. Chick-fil-A doesn't just sell chicken. They sell service. When you walk into the doors of Chick-fil-A, there is a distinction about them and all the other restaurants, fast food restaurants. As a matter of fact, Chick-fil-A is now the number three uh, top restaurant, uh, fast food restaurant in North America. Only followed by McDonald's, Starbucks, and now Chick-fil-A. They learn something. Their menu is not variety. Their menu is consolidated. And they focus on one thing that dis- makes them distinct from any other organization, and that is service. You see, service in the kingdom of Christ should be the hallmark of the believer. The fact that you are willing to testify the glory of God working in your life by serving one another is a hallmark of the Christian life. These are all introductory statements. So what would the church, the body of Christ, look like if we just decided to serve one another? Galatians 5, chapter number, or chapter number 5, verse 13 and 14 says this, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, say the next word, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You'll love your neighbor as you love yourself. So the prerequisite of the statement of loving one another was a hallmark indicative of saying that you should serve one another. So the indicative was this, you should serve one another. But the imperative was this, love one another. You can't have contrary because if you're going to love, you're going to serve. And if you're going to serve, you're going to love. And so therefore, do it in love as you serve. So we've been on this sermon series now. Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you be my neighbor? And what does that mean now? God created you and I to pour, not store. God created us to pour to not store. The Bible says that Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit of God, is a stream of flowing water. He is a fountain of flowing water. Did you know that that just keeps going? And when the Holy Spirit of God flows through you, you are now a conductive instrument ready to be used for God. You're created to pour, not to store. When you store, you end up getting very stale. And God didn't create you to be stale. So it's important that you have an outlet, that you have a tap where you can pour out. 
this is a silly little illustration, but um, I've done this several times. I think the guys were from, uh, a few of the guys originally, at least their, their ancestry or their family immigrated from here from Burma. I remember walking the streets in Burma with my wife and my kids, and I had a pastor friend of mine and his group with me. We were doing some mission work overseas, and um, it's a busy street and a busy intersection and as much of Asia and lots of cars going everywhere. And here we were. They didn't know how to cross the street because one of the neat things about Asia that's also very dangerous is that if you don't know how to cross the street, you can die. In third world countries and developing countries, the cars don't stop for you as they do in America where it's uh, pedestrians have the right of way. And so you, we were walking, and I was, um, my wife and I, we've been into Cambodia, and I remember my wife holding on to my arm, and cars are just going, and you don't stop. You just keep walking, and you uh, just trust that they see you, and you see them, and you're walking in the pace of the traffic. And so here we were just, wa- I mean, hundreds and thousands of cars just constantly, and I said, Susan, you trust me, right? She says, Sort of, kind of, but I don't trust them. And so I said, hold on to my arm and let's just go together. And so we were walking and we would take a couple steps, we would stop. And we would take a couple steps every time cars pass us by. And we were walking, we were about right in the middle of, uh, of the whole intersection. And all of a sudden there was a car coming super fast and she was a little uncertain whether or not they would remember uh, that we were like right there. And she freaked out a little bit and she's like, ah! And then they, it caused them to sort of freak out as well. And then which created a little bit of a traffic jam. So every single time I'm in Asia, I'll walk with a couple of my friends. I'll tell them the same thing. And one time I was with my friend from North Carolina. And I said to to him, you guys have to trust me. Just follow my lead. And before we even started, I held on to him. I I held on to him right before we even took a step into the traffic. And I said, poof, I saved your life. He's like, what are you talking about? Dude, I saved your life. You were going to get hit. There was no car coming. I was just trying to be silly. And, he said, and I said to him, in my country, you have to now be a servant for me because I saved your life. You have to give your life back to me now in servanthood. Silly illustration, but many ways God did that for us in a deeper way, obviously. That was a shallow illustration, but just to help us understand the concept that Christ gave himself for us. And that we have the privilege to now be a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mark 10, which is our passage of scripture. Verse number 41, if you have your Bible, you're welcome to turn there. If not, look on the screen and just follow along in the reading of this. Mark 10, verse number 41, when the ten heard it, they began to be very displeased with James and John. Man, I'm upset that you'd even ask this question. But Jesus called them together and he said, let's go for a huddle and let me, let, me, let me talk to you guys a little bit. You know that those who are appointed to rule over the Gentiles, they lord it over you. And their, they, they lord it over you and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be among you. Whoever would be great among you will be your servant. And whoever would be greatest must be The servant of all. So Jesus being countercultural says, if you really want to love me and if you really want to be great, you've got to learn how to serve. And you've got to learn how to not just serve, but if you want to be the greatest among the servants, you've got to be chief. You've got to be the greatest servant that there ever was. I love what he says in another passage of scripture in John 15, 20. He says, a servant is not greater than his master. Going back to Mark chapter 10, let me finish reading in verse 44 and 45. And whoever among you would be the greatest must be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. The word servant there talks about being a slave, being a helper. What does it mean to be a slave or helper? Now, the context of slave is not the same context that we understand it today. The ideology is talking about one who helps and who helps with whatever the need might be. Because in, 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 in terminology, when you are a slave, you're willing to do whatever it is the master wants you to do. 
And this is the expression within Bible context. I'm willing to do whatever God wants me to do. So let's talk a little bit about the practical ways that we can be a servant to our neighbor, amongst each other, and to this community. We have to answer the question, and you likely already answered the question, who is my neighbor then? In Luke chapter number 10, in verse number 36, it says this, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? I think Pastor Tim preached the message about the Good Samaritan a couple weeks ago. Well, you have to answer the question because uh, amongst the story of the, those three t- Samaritans, they finally asked, well, who's my neighbor and who should I love on? This guy who was beaten along the side of the road. And he said, the one, if you're wanting to know neighbor, who's your neighbor, who you should love, and who you should serve, the one who showed him mercy, that's the one who is a lover and who is a servant. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. That was an action. That wasn't an expression. Yeah, you should love your neighbor. That's an expression. Go and do likewise. That's an action. When you are serving, you've got to look for an actionable way to be the body of Christ. What actionable way? And we'll talk about that. So who is my neighbor? Number two, I love what Jesus says about doing good to others. It says to do good to others. So the neighbor is this, or Galatians says this in chapter 6, verse 10. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone. So the question then, well, who should I do good for? The Bible says if you have the opportunity to do good to everyone. So the question is, who are you living in service to? You're living in service to love and care for everyone that God gives you the privilege to encounter. But it doesn't stop there in Galatians 6.10. Do good to them as you're able to do it. But then the next point, number three, in Galatians 6 and verse 10, especially to those who are in the household of faith. So it says, if you will, in context, do everyone do good to those who, who are your neighbor, to everyone you can. But in Galatians 6.10, drills it down one more level and says to do good to them who are especially to the household of faith. So that means we're given the privilege to now exercise our serving to this body. To the kingdom of Christ, we're called to now be neighborly, to serve our one another in this kingdom of Christ, in this local church. Number three says, especially to those who are the household of faith. That's Discovery Church. That's the kingdom of Christ. Number four, God says for us to love our neighbor like we should love ourselves. And your pastors already shared on that thought, but I want to I want to add a little emphasis to this in a different aspect. In Mark chapter number 12, verse 31, Jesus told his audience, you should love your neighbor like you love yourself. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And with all your mind, and then I love what it says in conclusion, and love your neighbor as yourself. But we know that that's an imperative and an indicative that works together. Imperative suggests something, and indicative says, well, what's required of me then? So how do I make the two compatible? How do I love But then how do I reconcile that love and express that love so that it now becomes an action? And that's what we're talking about in the area of service. We're now putting hands and feet to to what that means to love our neighbor, to serve one another. I want to present you with a couple of practical ways that you can serve one another. Can I do that this morning? Here are some practical ways. You can pray for them. Let me add an emphasis. By name. You can pray for your church family by name. You can pray for your neighbors by name. One of the joys that I have is just um, learning how to pastor better and learning to love people better is whenever I meet someone, I try to remember their name and I try to remember their face. 
and then somehow, whether it's in a little journal, whether it's in, uh, on my little device, I try to jot that down and I try to remember their name. And here's one of my little keys. I pray for them, so therefore I remember them. That seems really insignificant and small, but to serve one another, it starts with just remembering their name. Wouldn't it be amazing, Discovery Church, if everyone knew each other's name? That sounds like, well, we already do. But you won't believe how hard that is, even in small group, like, ah. Oh, Pastor Tim, Tim, thanks for remembering all my boys' names. That was meaningful. That's learning to love and learning to serve. Would you make it a goal, a practical goal, to remember everyone's names? And then maybe share a prayer request. John, I, I want to pray for you about X, Y, and Z. Now all of a sudden I know John, I know his need. And now I can serve John because I know what his needs are. Can you imagine if you remember just your right-hand neighbor and your left-hand neighbor in your community? Just their names and their children and their family and one need that they have. How your neighbor, how you can be a light and salt in just your neighborhood of serving them. Just praying for them by name. It'll help you talk to God about your neighbor before you talk to God. Uh, it'll help you talk to God about your neighbor before you talk to your neighbor about God. When you start, I know that's, that was a little silly, but it's so helpful. If you talk to God about your neighbor, it'll help you talk to your neighbor about God. Add their names to your personal prayer list immediately so that you can begin talking to God about them. So when the time comes, God will open that window of opportunity for you to talk to God. Talk to them about God. Number two, stop by and say hello. Stop by and just say hello. You say, that seems so silly and just being neighborly. But I love my neighbors. John Blake is my neighbor. He, they're from the south. They're from Georgia. And they're really southern. If you talk to them, I love talking to them. I could just listen to them talk because they're just southern. But They'll randomly stop by my house, and I'll randomly stop by theirs. Sometimes it'll just be, hey, come on over. Teresa made a chocolate cake. How do you say no to chocolate cake? In Jesus' name. <laughs> Hallelujah, get in my belly. <laughs> but just stopping by shows that you care. A random text message today. Hey, man, I was just thinking about you. That's amazing. It goes a long way. It's incredible. Number three, meet a tangible need. Is there a tangible need that your neighbor might have? Do they need a car wash? I know that's, that, that sounds silly and just a, just a car wash. Like, what are you doing to my car? Just wanted to wash it. Why are there flowers in my front door? Just wanted to let you know I love you. Can you meet a tangible need to your neighbor? Something practical? Give a gift to them this holiday season. Could you possibly? We moved into our neighborhood, and my wife and my son's made chocolate chip cookies and we went to our immediate neighbors one to our left one to our right and the one right in front of us and we made them cookies we stopped by rang the doorbell and they're wondering who are you we're your new neighbors just wanted to introduce ourselves ourselves and here's some cookies they're the best cookies that my wife ever makes a little gift of expression during the holidays, it's so meaningful. The next one, invite them to church. Just inviting them. Don't put pressure on them about God and maybe you need to learn how to serve others as well. No, 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 just simply, man, I love our church. And I'd love to, if you guys are ever free on a Sunday, 
come worship with us at Discovery Church. You can serve them by introducing them to Jesus, by introducing them to Discovery Church. It's often easier to introduce someone to church than to shove Jesus down their throat. The next one. When the time is right, and the Lord will give you that grace and that strength in that moment, share the gospel with them. All of the other things I preluded, those would all be in vain if we never shared the gospel. To be neighborly is to share the gospel. Because to share the gospel is to share Christ's love. And to share love without showing the core of who love is would then be vain and superficial. That's why we serve in the name of Jesus. Because at the core of it, we serve out of love. And at the core of it, it's in Jesus' name that we serve. I don't know what the percentage here might be, but Lifeway Research just gave a description that says 61% of evangelicals have not yet shared their faith. Wow. That means at least 60% of this room. So I can just part the room and just say, look at a small crowd and just say everyone else minus this small crowd has shared Jesus with a neighbor. As believers, we've got to share the love of Christ. In concluding thoughts, I want to ask you these questions. Who is God calling you to serve this week? Think about the name that just popped in. Think about the face that just popped in. Write that name down and figure out a way you can pray for them this week and figure out how you're going to serve them this week. You already know a need that they have. I didn't put that name in there. I didn't put that need in there. The Holy Spirit of God did that right now for you. Whoever that is, God is calling you to serve them. How will you do it this week in order to live out the gospel of service? How will you do that? Share with your church family about what you've done to serve one another. In small groups this week, that should be one of the buzz things. Man, I've been praying for this neighbor, this friend, this coworker. I got to do this this week. It's almost contagious, almost like, man, I need to serve one another because you're doing it, you're doing it, you're doing it. Yes, you're right. Let's live out the gospel this week. Let's serve one another. Let's figure it out. And let's just get contagious about serving in love. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, let us consider then this. I love this passage. Let us consider this. How to stir up one another to love and to good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. At the beginning of that, it was talking about how do I spur each other up? How do I encourage one another to love Jesus, to be neighborly, to serve one another? Let's figure out how to do that this week, and let's do that in practical ways. We can all do that, can't we? Let's all stand to our feet, shall we? And we're going to close in prayer. And I just gave that to you as a concluding thought. But I'm praying that God will just begin already working in your heart. Lord Jesus, we know that it's only by your spirit, through your declared word, that God, you would have for us the truth of how to, how to serve and love one another and to love this neighbor and this community that you've called us to serve. So God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, would you allow us to live out Mark chapter 10, verse 45, that God, the greatest among us will be the servant. So today, God, we choose and we desire to be great in the kingdom of Christ, not in the kingdom of earth. So God, we desire to serve one another as you have called us into this greatness. As you're still praying all over this place, would you just pray, help me, Lord, to, to serve like Jesus, not just to listen to another message, but, but practically live out to be a doer of your word all across this place. If you're a believer, would you just pray that? Lord, help me to serve like Jesus. Hey, listen, if you don't know Jesus, you can't serve like Jesus. And so maybe as people are praying all over this place, believers are praying all over this place, if you've never surrendered your life over to Jesus, today could be the day of salvation. Today could change everything, completely change your trajectory and your eternal destination. So as believers, as the church is praying all over this place, Lord, help me to serve like Jesus. If you're, you're standing here and you're saying, I, I want to know Jesus. 
I don't know Jesus. I want to surrender my life over to Jesus. Would you just pray with me from your heart to God's? Jesus, dear Jesus, I, I, I am a sinner. And I need you today to save me. I believe that you came to this earth. You were crucified on a cross. You were placed in a grave. And you rose from that grave. To provide a forgiveness. To save me. To give me a hope. So today I completely trust in you. I confess, Jesus, you are Lord of my life. I surrender everything over to you. If that's your prayer today, would you just thank him? All across this place, those that are online, our coffee venue, would you just thank him? Thank you, Jesus, for saving me, for setting me free. As we close in just a moment, I want to invite you, uh, stop by one of our home team members. Let them know. We have, a, we have a, just a, a Bible, a little small Bible that we want to give you. And we want to encourage you. If you made that decision today, would you, would you let us know? Stop by one of our home team members, somebody that greeted you on your way in. They're going to greet you on your, on your way out. And would you just let them know, I made a decision today for Jesus. And so, Lord, we, we praise you. We celebrate you. Lord, you've been lifted up high in this place. Now, in just a moment, when all this is said and done, may you be lifted high outside of this place as we go and as we serve. And it's in the wonderful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you take your seats at this time? We're going to worship God through giving of tithes and offerings. He's the first priority in, in our home, in our life. I, I pray if, if, if you're a child of God, he's the first in your life. And so as those plates come by, if you fill out that connect card, would you place it in the offering plates? Would you place it in the plates as they come by? As those plates are coming by, I want to share with you uh, uh, something really cool. Uh, we kicked this off a few weeks ago. We have a partnership in Barona. Barona. I've been working on rolling my R, man, trying to sound a little Spanish. Not, 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 not too good. Still got a little ways to go. But we have a partnership in Barona. That's better. Dominican Republic. And, uh, and so we will we'll be sending a team in January. And then we'll be sending another team in June. If you want to get in on the June trip, come on, see myself, see Pastor Mike, our family pastor, and you can get in on that trip. It's a week long in Barona, Dominican Republic. And so the team in January, the team in January are taking these, these boxes. Uh, you've heard of maybe Operation Christmas Child. This is our version of it because we're planted in Dominican Republic. There's about 100 children uh, around this base that we go and serve twice a year. And so we're taking these boxes, and so we have a goal of 100 to take 100 of these in January. And so I want to invite you to go to uh, your nearest Dollar Tree, right, <laughs> your near, wherever the Lord leads you. Uh, but uh, that would just be my, my, my preference. And uh, you can fill this bad boy up for 10 bucks and bless a child. And uh, most importantly, as we meet tangible needs, uh, man, we introduce them to Jesus, which changes, again, changes everything. And so uh, at our giving kiosk in the hallway, at our giving kiosk, we have uh, a list of, of what, what you could make a, put in the box. And so would you just stop by uh, in, in the hallway and pick up a list. And then next week, bring your box. Bring your box. Again, the goal is 100. Pray as these boxes go. Also, if you could put in $5, that goes to shipping. It's $1.50 per pound. And so that would help us offset some of those costs. And Discovery will pick up the rest of the costs, okay? Hey, man, it's been a, what a powerful worship experience. Thank you, my brother, Chanta, Jim, for bringing the word. And uh, Jabba Chip. And so we are, uh, we're moving on to the uh, coffee environment. If you're, you're newer to Discovery, you want to know what Discovery is all about, where we're going, who we are, then I want to invite you to join me for a 15-minute uh, after party, 15-minute after party in our coffee environment. That's a 15-minute after party. Come on, hang out with me for 15 minutes, learn about Discovery a little bit, who we are, where we came from, and where we're going. God bless you. Man, go serve like Jesus.